Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Trinity Gardens Wednesday Night Bible Study. I'm Brother Marthorn, one of the ministers here at the Trinity Gardens Congregation. I personally thank you for inviting me into your homes and your other personal spaces, whether it is by Facebook, YouTube, Zoom, and all other media outlets that we've made available to you uh, here at Trinity Gardens Church of Christ. We will continue our study under the theme, The Will to Win, and specifically, we will talk about defeating our past because there are things in our past, whether they're past experiences or past memories, that can threaten our ability to persevere. And so what we will do is we will look at some characters from the scripture, as well as some remedies from the scripture that will equip us with the things that we need to continue to look forward and not look behind. Please go to God with me in prayer. Our Father in heaven, right now we approach you with submissive hearts. We submit to you because you are the most high. We submit to you because of your might. We submit to you because of your greatness. We submit to you because of your mercy. Lord, we love you. And we pray, Father, that we would allow you to just cultivate love within us in such a way that we will get to a place to where we're able to love others the way that you love us. Lord, we ask you to forgive us of the sins that we've committed, regardless of how we've committed them. Please heal those who are sick and comfort those who are in mourning. Father, we also pray for our families that they will continue to be strengthened and also for our, our children, our youth, who have recently uh, returned to school, that you would just cover them, protect them as well. Lord, we ask that as we study your word, that we would do it with open and receptive hearts and allow the things that you share with us to fashion us so that each day we will look more and more like you. And it is in Jesus' name we humbly pray. Amen. Defeating our past. You know, dealing with the past is a, it can be kind of, uh, it can be difficult because there are emotions attached to events that occurred. Uh, there are things ingrained in our memory and the memory of others so that when we move forward and progress in our lives, for whatever reason, either we can't let the past go or people who remember when cannot let it go. Uh, sometimes the past has a way of defeating us as opposed to us defeating it. So to set the tone, we're going to look at some individuals from God's word who had, who did some things in their past that you know, for lack of a better way of saying it, that were pretty bad. <laughs> Nevertheless, God continued to use them and we'll be able to draw from their example and move forward with the confidence and assurance that in spite of what we've done in our past, God is still able to use us. These individuals that we will look at, we will see that they did not allow their past experiences to uh, to kill or destroy their will to win spiritual battles and glorify God. Because there are some things that, that are damaging. There are some things that can, that can just make you say, you know what, why don't I just stay at home and never go outside again? Or why don't I just pick a new circle of friends who may not remember things about me you know, that have, that have happened to me or that I may have done, or some may even get to a place to where they do what Judas did when he realized that he had, um, that he had betrayed Christ and, and commit suicide. Yes, yeah, some past memories can be, can affect people to that extent. But the key is we got to remember that the things that we've done in our past or the things that may have happened to us in our past are not the, the totality of who we are now. 
and also those things have can be used to to uh to teach us life lessons and to shape our character and ultimately ultimately make us stronger so just because we have a past doesn't mean that we should not be uh progressive in our present and to work toward building a brighter future so who are some people that we will look at who had a bad past who did some things that that were that would be deemed as horrible but nevertheless god continued to use them well we're familiar with king david you know while everybody remembers david that's one of those good sunday school uh figures that we learned about when we were children david the same david who was described as a man after god's own heart the same david who as a boy had more courage than trained soldiers and stood up against goliath the same david who was a loyal son that took care of his father's flock, uh, the same David who later became king, uh, he did some things that that were bad. Uh, we remember uh, the story about his affair with Bathsheba, right? He stood on a roof. He saw her bathing. He liked what he saw. He acted on it. Uh, Bathsheba was a married was a married woman. Actually, and she was married to one of his most loyal soldiers, Uriah the Hittite. Bathsheba got pregnant. Uh, David tried to encourage Uriah to go lay with his wife to cover up what he had done. Uriah didn't do it, so David had him killed. Uh, as time progressed, uh, the child was born that he fathered with Bathsheba, and the uh, the child's life was taken. So here it is, David made a decision that affected the life of Uriah, <clears throat> the life of Bathsheba, and the life of a of an innocent child. You know, he he made a decision based on what he wanted to do and didn't take into account that one, it was wrong, but secondly, the lives that were affected by it. Also in Second Samuel twenty four uh, verse 17, we see that he, uh, he took a census in which he, uh, he numbered, he numbered the, uh, the amount of warriors that he had in his, uh, in his kingdom, the number of fighting men, as some would describe it. So if you will, I'm going to turn to that passage and read it for us in, <clears throat> excuse me, in Second Samuel. Uh, chapter 24, verse 1 through 17. I'm not going to read the whole passage, but there are some things that I do want to highlight from that passage in Second Samuel chapter 24, verses 1 through 17. And particularly, I want to look at verse number, verse number 10. And I'm reading from the New King James. Listen to what the Bible says. And David's heart condemned him after he had numbered the people. So David said to the Lord, I have sinned greatly in what I have done. But now I pray, O Lord, take away the iniquity of your servant, for I have done foolishly. Now let's scroll down to verse number 15. So the Lord sent a plague upon Israel from the morning till the appointed time, from Dan to Beersheba, 70,000 men of the people died. All right. So we see where David again made a bad decision. He was a warrior king. And as a warrior king, he took pride in the, in the fighting men that he had at his, um, uh, under his, under his leadership. So he had his general to go out and count them. The general had some discomfort and he said, well, hey, may God increase our troops a hundredfold while you're still hitting, sitting here to see it. But nevertheless, he took orders from David, went out, counted the people. Uh, David realized he had done wrong. God held him accountable and 70,000 people died. Now I want us to just sit down and think about that. You make a decision to satisfy yourself 
which results in 70,000 people being killed. That's, that, that's pretty bad. Now, how does that affect us? There are some things in our past that we deal with that we did to ourselves. In both instances of David's experiences, those things were self-inflicted, okay? Now, there are some things that decisions that others have made that have affected people. Uh, it could be uh, that you're a bad spender and you don't manage your money well. And because you're a bad spender, you just spend, 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 and then take into account the needs of your household. Or even if you're a single person, your financial responsibilities that are attached to that. Or uh, you may be a person who is on a diet. The doctor recognized that you have some health problems and has given you a strict diet. But because there are certain foods you like to eat, you just jump out, do it anyway. You become sick. And now you're in a position where your family has to adjust their lives to take care of you. Or it could be that you're just a, a person who's so self-absorbed that you don't think about anyone else. There are people in your lives that need help, people in your lives who you could benefit and help along the way. But because you're so all about self and what you want to do, people are around you who may have supported you on your way up are, are experiencing bad times and hardships all because you can't get self out of the way. And you may have come to a point to where you look back on your life and say it, you know what, I should have slowed down and thought about someone else other than me. And it cuts you to your heart because you you realize what you've done. But nevertheless, God still used David and he's able to use you as well. Or what about Saul who later became Paul? Paul did some things out of ignorance simply because what I mean by ignorance as I'm using it here is he didn't know any better. I know when we talk about somebody acting ignorant, we talk, you know, it, it refers to people who may have an obnoxious um, mentality, bad attitude, talk crazy, do hurtful things. Well, Paul did some things that, and that resulted in him hurting people because he didn't know any better. Listen to uh, what the Bible says in Acts chapter 9, verse 1 and 2, and this, like the previous passages from the New King James Version as well. Then Saul, still breathing threats, and murder against the disciples of the Lord went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus so that if he found anyone who were of the way, the way meaning the way of Christ, Christianity, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. So Saul was a very devout practicer, a very devout person who practiced Judaism. That was his religious practice. He was devout. He was committed or as some say he was true to it, if you will. And he saw Christians as people who were acting out against God. Because of his religious zeal and his fear of God, he went to the high priest and said, I want some arrest warrants so that on my way to Damascus, if I find anybody who is following this man called Christ, I want to be able to tie him up, bring him here so that they could be dealt with. The Bible says that his, the Bible shows us that his zeal was so strong that the phrase it uses is still breathing threats and murder. I want us to listen to that still breathing threats and murder. If you're breathing threats and murder, that means that that's an objective that is so ingrained in your mind that you can't think about anything else. But we know what happened on Saul's way to Damascus. He met Jesus and he was later baptized by Ananias. He became a Christian and made a positive impact. He wrote many epistles to help God's people. But nevertheless, in his past, he did some things out of ignorance. And we may have done some things out of ignorance. Uh, we may have been brought up in a home where Christian values weren't practiced. And, and the things that were shown and taught us at home, we may have brought that to our own household, even right down to the way that we treat our spouses, the way that we discipline children, the way that we talk to our spouses, the way that we talk to children. But later on, you realize, later on, you learn better, but you looked at the people that you've hurt all because you didn't know any better. And it's, it's hard to, to let that go. Or maybe you, you said some things that you thought were appropriate 
Or maybe you did some things to hurt people that you thought were appropriate, but you did it simply because you didn't know any better. And that stain is attached to your past. And there are other people who may not ever let you live it down. But look at what Paul did. He continued to go forward. God used him in a mighty way. And he impacted the lives of a lot of people. Then we have Peter. Uh, Peter did some things. And the, the thing that I want to highlight in particular was because of his uh, immaturity. You know, Peter did a lot of things. Uh, but the one that I want to highlight is him denying Christ. In Matthew chapter 26, 73 through 75, uh, before I read this passage, we know that Peter was temperamental. You know, he had a bad temper. He, you know, he carried a sword. We know that he's on record for cursing. We also read in Acts 10, that he uh, that he uh, discriminated against people who wasn't from the same background that he was. But I want to look at him denying Christ because this speaks to his immaturity. Matthew chapter 26, 73 through 75. And a little later, those who stood by came up and said to Peter, surely you also are one of them for your speech betrays you. Then he began to curse and swear saying, I do not know the man. Immediately a rooster crowed, and Peter remembered the word of Jesus who said to him, Before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. So he went out and wept bitterly. Now Peter, we see later on, he matured, and the Lord used him to preach the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. But he wasn't always the person that he was in Acts chapter 2 and following. And my brothers and sisters, we were not always the people that we are. Peter denied Christ. Why did he deny him? Either because he was too afraid to stand up or he didn't know how to stand up for him. That speaks to immaturity. Uh, our levels of maturity directly impact the way that we handle certain uh, situations or the way that we respond to certain ordeals or predicaments that we find ourselves in. Maybe during your lifetime, when you were not as mature as you are now, you witnessed some things that happened to people and said nothing. You could, you, maybe you were in a position to speak up or to have done something to have made a difference, but because you were, but just because of your own inexperience and lack of maturity, you, you stood by. Or maybe you were easily influenced to do some things that, you know, that you know you shouldn't have done that affected people just simply because you were not strong enough. But I, I want to just share with you that if you hang in there with God, God will strengthen you. And the Peter that we saw in Matthew 26 was not the Peter that we saw in Acts 2. And neither is he the Peter that we read about. And neither is he the Peter that wrote those uh, those letters, 1 Peter 1 and 1 Peter 2. Life is a progression. And as we grow, we got to trust God enough to allow his process for developing us to play out. And along the way, we will make some bad choices, whether it's because we're self-serving like David was, ignorant like Saul was, who later became Paul, or immature like Peter was, all right? Um, and then we have another aspect of our past where we may not have done things to harm ourselves or harm others, but perhaps someone may have done something to harm us. Uh, we remember the story of Joseph. Look at Genesis chapter 37, verses 27 and 28. Excuse me. Come. And let us sell him to the Ishmaelites, and let not and let not our hand be upon him, for he is our brother in our flesh. And his brothers listen. Then Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit, and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty shekels of silver, and they took Joseph to Egypt. And we know what happened to Joseph while he was in Egypt. You know, he was working for a man named Potiphar whose wife lied and said he tried to rape her. He went to prison as an innocent man. 
However, because of his gift and because of his ability to interpret dreams, it opened a door of opportunity for him to get a position in the palace. Now, Joseph could have given up. You know, he didn't do anything wrong, but he had brothers who were jealous of him. Uh, father, His father didn't help that situation because his father publicly declared him as his favorite son and, and treated him as such, which I want to drop this in for those of you uh, parents who who have children. I know you have different I know you have children with different personalities that cause you to respond differently, but if you want your children to remain united, don't do to your child what Joseph's father did to him because it will provoke animosity among your children. Let's not stray too far from the point. If anybody had a reason to complain, to be angry, and to be bitter, Joseph had one because, again, he did absolutely nothing wrong. And I don't know about you, but to be mistreated does cause pain, but it's even more painful when it's someone close to you, like your family. You know, your family, they know our vulnerabilities. We have a trust toward them. And when they break that trust by doing something to us, it hurts. Uh, something else along those lines that could be painful. Maybe you were in a bad relationship and and got your heart broken. You know, you invested all of your emotions and all of your love toward your significant other only to find out that they were not as serious about you as you were about them. Or what about you took someone to be a friend? You trusted them only to discover that they were your enemy the whole time. That hurts. That can make you want to either do something out of character. You understand where I'm going with that. Or it can make you want to uh, to give up on life in general. But here's some things that we should do with our past experiences. And there are some quotes from some famous people that I'm going to share. And then we're going to go to the scripture and close out. Somebody famous once said, the past is a stepping stone, not a millstone. So in other words, those bad experiences, just just keep on moving. Use them as stepping stones toward your future. A millstone is something that's real heavy. And one thing that people would do if they wanted to kill someone during the time millstones was used is they would tie a millstone around a person's neck and throw them in the, and throw them in the sea or throw them in a body of water because they knew that millstone was so heavy that person couldn't swim and they would die. So simply put, do not allow past experiences to kill you. Instead, learn from them and grow for, from them. Keep living. Uh, Someone else famous, uh, we might know the musician Johnny Cash, he goes into detail. He goes, you build on failure. You use it as a stepping stone. Close the door on the past. You don't try to forget the mistakes, but you don't dwell on that. Now, I'm going to go a step further and say, don't dwell on it and don't allow them to dwell in you. Dwell describes to live or to take up residence. Let your past experiences that are painful know that they no longer have a room in your mind's home. They, that they can't just stay there. They, they might show up and visit periodically, but to take permanent residence when it, within our minds, we, we can't allow them to do that anymore. And then he goes on to say, if you don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time or any of your space. So in other words, we can overcome it if we do not allow it to have any of our energy because if we hold on to the past, it can drain our energy, any of our time. When we lose energy, then we lose time. We cannot perform as well as we need to perform. Or any of our space, it can cloud up the space in our minds to where we're making judgments based on what happened in the past. We make decisions and judgments about people based on things that we may have experienced. In other words, we could take something <clears throat> that... I, I could take something that someone did to me and project that energy onto you and have you suffering consequences for something that someone else has done to me. That's wrong. You sh you're an innocent person and should not be penalized for that. But in order to keep that from happening, I cannot allow that to occupy space in my life to the extent that I'm controlled by it. Let me share with you what Judge Foreman says. Now, if anybody can is a testimony when it comes to rebounding from the past. He is one. 
we cannot even talk about heavyweight boxing without going back to the to fight the fight that he lost in Zaire when uh against Muhammad Ali it was tagged the rumble in the jungle but one thing that we can admire about George Foreman is later in life he returned to boxing and he was successful at it but look at what he says he says <clears throat> so learning to enjoy today has two benefits now we can't enjoy to today if we're thinking about yesterday he said learning to enjoy today has two benefits it gives me happiness right now and it becomes a good memory later so one way to get over the past is to cre create some good memories right now enjoy today so that they could become good memories later now as we go to the scripture there are some things in god's word that he communicates to us about overcoming the past in Genesis 41, 50 and 52, look at what Joseph did. And to Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, whom Asenath, the daughter of Potiphera, priest of On, bore to him. Joseph called the name of his firstborn Manasseh, for God has made me forget all my toil and my father's house. In the name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. Now look at what he says. He says, God got him to a place to where he was able to forget his past and made it possible for him to be fruitful in his land of affliction. In that very land where he was imprisoned, in that very land where he was falsely accused of rape, Joseph became prosperous. In my church family, if he did it for Joseph way back then, he could do it for you and I today. Our afflictions and, and the mess around us has no bearing on what God is able to do. But our outlook on life can affect that. We just got to trust that he's able to do it and release those things from our lives that prohibit us from having adequate amount of trust in him. <clears throat> in Philippians chapter 3, 12 through 15, uh, not that I've already attained, or I'm ready, or I'm already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward or high call of God in Christ Jesus. Now, notice Paul said he forgot and he reached, okay? One of the reasons it's hard to defeat the past is because we're not reaching for anything else. It's easy to say forget and not have anything else to do. We gotta add some other things to our lives to take our minds off all of those, those bad past experiences. If we have some productive things in our lives, then our focus is on those things that are productive and that will enhance us. I want you to hear me and hear me very well. Painful things in the past, and I don't know what happened to you in your past, but we've all have something. Again, whether it's some things we did or some things that were done to us. But if we don't replace those bad memories by creating things that will enhance and strengthen us and 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 for our and will contribute to our own betterment, we will never get beyond where we are. Listen, God has a great purpose for all of us. Out of all the things that he could have done, he created you and he created me. And that stuff in the past that's holding us down, guess what? It by no means compare to the greatness that God has for us in the future. And I'm not just talking about heavenly greatness. We can do a lot of great things here while we're living. And I'm not limiting greatness to just earnings, but we can impact the lives of people. That's that's more valuable than, than dollars. Now, don't get me wrong. I encourage everyone to earn as much as they can, as long as it's done legally and in line with the will of God. But think about this. What if, in addition to earning what you can, you're able to influence people to operate within the realm of godliness? Imagine if we lived in a life surrounded by people who had godly ethics and who had a level of integrity that was influenced by God's righteousness. Imagine what that life would be like. So let's not stray too far from the point. Remember that in order to forget, we got to reach ahead. 
Now look at what else Paul says in verse number 15. He says, therefore, let as many as are mature have this mind. And I'm going to stop right there on 15. This is a maturation process. To get over your past or to defeat your past and keep it from defeating you or keep it from defeating us, we got to have a mindset that says, I'm bigger than what happens to me. I'm greater than what happens to me. That happened to me. I have outgrown the things that I've done, and I'm going to outgrow the things that may have been done to me. So it's a, a maturity, a, mat a maturation opportunity. Next thing, and this is one of the greatest of all in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh, 16 and 17, even though we have known Christ according to the flesh. The flesh, that's that past stuff that people like to bring up again. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he or she, for that matter, is a new creation. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. The Lord has positioned us to experience the newness of life. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Each day is a new day that the Lord has blessed you and I to experience. Each day is a new day that God has blessed each of us to experience. So let's take advantage of that new day as opposed to giving it away to the pain that's in the past. And as I get ready to close, when it comes to dealing with our past, let's set some realistic expectations. Here are some realistic expectations. As we let go of the past, realistic expectation number one, know that something else will happen. Let me, under, let me help you understand. We're not perfect. People around us are not perfect. At some point, someone may do something else to offend you, or we may do something to offend them. But guess what? It's not the end of the world. All right? So set a realistic expectation. One of the reasons why people don't let go of the past is because they're so afraid that they're going to open themselves up to be hurt again. Life is not perfect. But in order to get strong enough to deal with future pains, you got to let go of the one in the past. Second, don't be afraid to forgive yourself and don't be afraid to forgive others. It's hard to forgive ourselves because in most cases, we hold ourselves to a higher standard than we hold others. But if we're going to move forward, that stuff that we may have done that impacted the lives of others, the things we may have done due to immaturity, the things that we may have done ignorantly, forgive ourselves for it. The Lord is willing to forgive us. In his greatness, if he's willing to forgive us, then we should be willing to forgive ourselves. Another thing, remember that retaining or holding on to that past, it causes it to mentally snowball. That means that problem becomes greater and greater and greater and greater and eventually control our lives. And that's a realistic expectation. If you hold on to it, it will control your life. Another realistic expectation. Even though you've moved beyond your past, you'll never forget what happened. But the key is don't allow past memories to impede on present progress. And finally, finally letting go of things that happened in the past does not make you look weak to others, and neither does it necessarily reveal your weaknesses or inadequacies to others. It just means that you let something go so that you can continue to get ahead. And so my church family, prayerfully, we've shared something that will help us to defeat our past as opposed to allowing our past to defeat us. May God continue to bless you, keep you, and may his face shine upon you.